Today's guest is Liv Colley, a singer-songwriter from Nashville. Liv has big dreams and a big sound to back them up. Welcome, Liv. How's it going? Thank you. It's going well. How about you? Doing so good. So let's start back at the beginning. Where were you born and raised? And then how did music first come into your life? Um, I was born and raised right outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, So like nowhere near the country music scene. (laughs) Um, I just loved music from a young age. My dad's a writer. He's not a songwriter, but he's like a creative writer and he owns a newspaper company. And so I get like my creative genes from him. Um, But I've just loved singing since I was born really. And I mean, I just loved music and music has been such a big part of my life. So um, yeah, I was just like, I want to make it. (laughs) That's awesome. What kind of music did um, you listen to growing up? What kind of music was your family listening to? I mean, we, it really varied, especially as I got older. So like, I wasn't raised on country music. I'm from Boston. My parents, you know, they're big fans of the Eagles. They're big fans of, my dad loves Melissa Etheridge, um, like Fleetwood Mac, kind of like alternative rock growing up like that. Um, And then when I hit high school, that's kind of when I first was introduced to country music. And it was actually by watching Carrie Underwood on American Idol. Nice. So I was like 12 or 13 watching her and I was like, she is just so incredible and I just want to be her. So, <laughs> so that was like my first introdu- introduction to country music and she sang a Mar- uh, Martina McBride song on the show. So then I got introduced to Martina and then it just kind of went from there. That's amazing. Um, were you, what were you doing with singing growing up? Like, were you singing, performing for people? Were you writing songs at some point? Were you playing any instruments? What was that early experience like? Yeah, I was definitely like a musical theater geek. That was where I landed in school. (laughs) So I was in all the musicals growing up. Um, And then once I hit high school is kind of when I realized like my voice really isn't musical theater-ish. And so I had a vocal coach and she was amazing. And she was kind of the first one that was like, you have a real kind of country twang, which makes no sense because I'm from Boston. But I do think watching Carrie and like from such a pivotal age that I was at when I watched her and my voice was kind of first developing. And I think I really was just trying to like grow and mimic her in a way. So I think that's where I really got the countryness of my voice. Um, but I mean, I took vo- voice lessons all throughout high school. I was in vocal, you know, concerts and stuff. And uh, when I was a junior in high school, I actually uh, like produced and put on a charity concert at my high school for St. Jude's. So that was my first like real show where I perform my own original music um but yeah so I've just always loved singing and I hate public speaking but I love singing in public (laughs) yeah it's interesting how that works like it's not always both for people (laughs) yeah so you mentioned you played original songs at what point did you start writing your own songs I first wrote like my first full song when I was probably 15 um I wrote it with my first guitar, which my dad bought me for like $50 off eBay or Craigslist or something like that. It wasn't anything fancy. Um, and I wrote it like on the beach. I, th- I had just gotten like broken up with by a dude I was dating for like two months. <laughs> so it, back in the day, that was heart wrenching. So <laughs> I wrote my first song after that. And then I just loved it so much and I felt it came very easily to me. So I just really followed that from there. Wow, that's awesome. Um, how would you say your early songs compare to your songs now? Like what was different about them? Oh God. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I, first of all, I scrubbed the internet of any of my early songs and it's not that they were bad. I just feel like I've grown as an artist as anybody would by this yeah. from when they're 15 into their twenties. Um, so, I mean, my first songs are actually very similar to my current songs just like lyrically we've grown <laughs> um but i've always been kind of the like country pop and now i'm a little bit more rock because i love rock um so it's they're similar just like hopefully better <laughs> yeah i got you at what point did you decide that you wanted to be an artist and like actually dedicate to music That was probably when I was going off to college. So my voice coach was the one that recommended the school that I went to, which is Belmont University in Nashville. I had never heard of it. I mean, I'm from, like I said, Massachusetts. I had, you know, I knew what Nashville was. I didn't know any schools down there. I had actually applied an audition to get into Berkeley, which is right in Boston, obviously the big music school. I didn't get in. I was crushed and heartbroken. 
And then my voice coach was the one that said, you need to check out Belmont. She had a student that had gone there and really enjoyed it. So I actually um, submitted for their songwriting program and I got in. And so I was like, well, it's fake. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So growing up in Boston, um, was Berkeley like always your vision for your life and like what you wanted to do? It was. And I remember I, they sent out like the acceptance or rejections letters via email it was like a Monday night or a Sunday night at midnight and it was very dramatic. And so I stayed up, like my parents stayed up and I got that rejection email and I had to miss school the next day. I was so devastated because like, that was my plan. That was everything I had focused on was Berkeley. I'm going to Berkeley, staying in Boston. You know, that was my plan. But honestly, I am thankful I didn't get in. And I firm believer that everything happens for a reason. Um, just because, you know, I would have wanted to eventually go to Nashville anyway. And so I just kind of skipped four years of not being there. And I was able to cultivate such amazing connections through the school I went to. And so I'm just a firm believer that everything happens for a reason. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what was it first like moving out to Nashville and going to Belmont? What were your first experiences? Was it overwhelming? Was it super comfortable for you? What were you like? It was terrifying. Um, Growing up, I was the type of person that like, I never even liked sleepovers. I hated being away from home. I had the worst anxiety. So to literally just like pack up my stuff and move across the country, it made no sense. Like I shouldn't have been doing that, but I did. And it was very worth it. And I'm very happy I did. But I just remember I was so terrified. It was so scary. And but Nashville just really welcomed me. I mean, it's not like a pretentious city. It's very welcoming. And I just felt very comfortable very soon after getting there. Um, I mean, it was a humbling experience because, you know, with anything in high school or from a small town, which I'm from, if you're good at something, you're usually like the best in your town. But then you move to a city like Nashville and you're like, oh, you're taken down a few notches because, you know, there are people there that are, years and miles ahead of you so it was a humbling experience but it was scary and exciting and amazing yeah it seems like that's a common story is like very humbling I mean you even hear about stories like Garth Brooks I mean he started I think it's in Oklahoma you know he was like the king of his small town and he moved to Nashville and he even he, he got overwhelmed you know he was like I'm a nobody all of a sudden and how do you deal with that and I think it's just something everybody kind of goes through in Nashville or often a lot of the times oh, um, so yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, what was the first, what were the first steps you did in Nashville? Did you start recording? Did you start performing? Did you just work on yourself? What was your goal? So when I first moved to Nashville, like I said, I moved for school. So I was a freshman in college and the first two years, I really, like, I didn't even really write much music because I don't know if it's like this at a lot of schools, but like you take a lot of gen eds the first two years. You don't take a lot of classes that actually have to do with your major. My major was songwriting. And so I didn't end up doing that until about like end of sophomore into junior year. So I didn't record anything. I really was just trying to settle in and like learn the city and feel comfortable in the city. And so I really didn't do anything music wise until my junior year. Looking back, I kind of regret it just because you learn quickly that every year counts when you're here. But at the same time, like I had a great college experience and I am happy that I did what I did. Um, but yeah, I would say that I really didn't like hit the ground running when it came to music because I had no idea anything in the city. I didn't know about studios. I didn't know about, you know, I didn't have any co-writers. I was just a little 18 year old that was in a city I had never even been in before moving there. Yeah. What's a specific action you wish you would have taken early in your time in Nashville, like that first year, like looking back, you wish you would have done? I didn't play any shows until like end of my senior year of college. I wish I had started playing shows earlier. And that would be like my biggest piece of advice for anybody moving to Nashville is just like, as terrifying as it seems, just like go and play shows, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's really scary. But once you get the first one out of the way, you're like, okay, this is, I'm in a groove now. So I would recommend that. Sorry, there's a helicopter now. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Where would you say these artists should start? Like if you're saying go play a show, what's the first step they should take to make that happen? Because I know a lot of artists, they'd move there and they probably feel overwhelmed. Like, where do I even begin? Who do I contact? You know? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I'm still to this day, my own booking manager, like I don't have anybody that does that for me. So the sooner that you just Google venues for songwriters, just Google them, Google the contact info and just start like cold emailing out to people. Um, a lot of the venues, it took me about a year to even get a response. But then once you're like, once you play a few shows, then they know you. And so I can reach out and, you know, I can book them very easily now, whereas before, I really couldn't. So I would say the sooner, like as soon as you get to Nashville, just reach out to venues. Don't worry about looking stupid. Literally everyone's doing it. Um, and don't worry if you don't have any like credentials under your belt or anything like that, because if you just keep like annoying the right people, then you will get to book stuff and you can build up the resume. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. It sounds like just get this process started because it doesn't all happen at once. So the sooner you get the engine revving, I guess, the better it's going to be for you later. Yep. Perfect. So what was, what were some of the biggest things you got out of going to Belmont? Like, what did you learn? What'd you take from it? I would say the biggest, most important things I actually took away from Belmont were connections. Uh, my songwriting professors, it's like my songwriting classes were actually in a separate building right on Music Row, like literally directly across the street from a major record label. So my songwriting professors were professional songwriters. Like they weren't full-time professors. They were, I mean, like one of my songwriting professors was signed to Disney Publishing. So she had written like for Miley Cyrus and like all these huge artists. And then another one um, had written a lot of hits for Hunter Hayes and just like all these huge artists. And it's just like, oh, okay, this is really cool. Um, and so through my, one of my professors, I was able to get one of my first internships who I was working for Rascal Flats in Brothers Osborne. And so I would say connections alone were worth it to go to school. Um, and of course you learn important, you know, songwriting tips and music tips as well. And like I was a music business minor. So I learned a lot about the music industry in that sense, because being an artist and a writer, you really need to know the business side as well in order to not get screwed over. So it was a really good experience um, and I recommend it. You know, I've had people reach out to me from Boston and other places that ask about like my college experience because they're interested in applying. And I always say that it is absolutely worth it. You just have to really make good use of your time there and use the connections that are given to you. Yeah, that's great advice. And that's something I actually hear a lot. It's like the people who go to school for um, music end up having connections be the biggest thing they get from it. Um, yep, exactly. it's, it's, I mean, you hear it's all about who you know, and I guess that's true because, you know, it seems like even if you don't have a ton of knowledge, even if you don't go to school, you can learn a lot by who you know. And if they like being around you, they're going to be willing to share with you and give you opportunities. So I feel like connections are like the currency for music. It really is. I mean, and we like in my songwriting classes, we would get other songwriters, like professional songwriters that would come in as guest speakers. And they all would say like, you really, you don't need a songwriting degree, but what you're going to learn here from these actual professionals is worth it and the connections that they can give you. So that's a big thing. Yeah, absolutely. So when did you first start recording? Um, when did you start to put these ideas down into actual things people could listen to? So I recorded, I think it was like four songs when I was 15 or 16. And they were the first songs I really ever wrote. I went in and I recorded them and I'm proud of them. You know, I'm, I joke that I'm embarrassed by them, which I kind of am, but I'm also proud of them because they, you know, it was my first time being in a studio and I learned a lot and that was that. So then the first time I really actually went into like a Nashville recording studio was when I was, I was like 22 and I recorded my first single and it was like such a crazy experience just walking into the studio. These musicians because they had like these professional studio musicians and they would listen to like a verse and a chorus of my work tape and look at like the Nashville number chart that they would write in and they'd just be able to go in and play it perfectly and I was it was better than even I could picture in my mind it was crazy so it was just so exciting for me to finally hear like my music be brought to life in a way that I didn't even think possible. Yeah, that's amazing. I, that's something I've learned about, too, as talking to artists like the Nashville number chart. I've heard of that being outside of Nashville. Right. Um, I'll be, when did you learn about that? Like, what was your experience with that? Uh, I still don't even really understand it that well, but <laughs> I learned about it in school because I took like music theory classes and a lot of music industry classes. So they introduced the Nashville number chart to us. And 
I had to take tests on it and study it. And to this day, I really can't even tell you much about it. But (laughs) but if you are like a studio musician or you're an audio engineer, technology or something like that, then obviously they know better than I probably should. I should probably learn more about it. But (laughs) you know, if that's used outside of Nashville or is it just called, is it just because it's owned by Nashville pretty much? I'm sure it is, and they might they might not call it the Nashville number chart, but I know that when you go into any studio, they chart out your like chords and your rhythm and stuff like that. So it might not be called the Nashville number chart outside of Nashville, but a variant of used. <laughs> Super interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna look that up too. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So, um, what was it like first releasing those songs in Nashville? Like, were you nervous about it? Were you comfortable about it? And then, what were the steps you took as soon as those were released to get them out there? I was definitely nervous, but I was very excited just because at that point, like I had been in Nashville for four years. Um, I hadn't released any music. I really, you know, the city didn't know who I was as an artist or a writer. So I was like, okay, it's time. Like I got to release this. Um, So I released my first single and it went nowhere as most first singles usually do. Actually, I even messed up using like the distributor. So I had, um, I had like advertised this big release date on a certain day on a Friday. And then the night before I got an email saying that like I hadn't submitted it to the distributor in time. So it wasn't released tomorrow. So then I had to like post about that and be like, just kidding. Um, (laughs) So obviously that was a learning experience. And, you know, when it comes to distributing and all that kind of stuff, um, I learned a lot that way. But I would say my first like real kind of step into the city and into the music industry is when I released my first EP when I was um, in like, it was like 2017, um, so which was five, five songs. And that was really my first introduction as who I am as an artist. You know, I had learned way more from the first single I had released. And um, I learned a lot about marketing and I had studied other artists and what they did. So I took all of that and I used it to release my first EP. So that, I mean, it wasn't, you know, it didn't, crush any records or anything but I got you know like 70,000 streams on it and all over the world which was just like not even imaginable for someone like me you know I don't have a label I don't have a publisher so that was really cool and so from that every time you release music I think I learn a lot and that I learned a lot that way so then I released my next single and I was like okay so this works for that let's try that and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's interesting as artists, we kind of look back and like you said, you're kind of like embarrassed about our first songs and things like that, but they are so important to becoming like able to make those releases like that EP where they finally take off. Like we couldn't just, a lot of us couldn't just release one song and have it blow up. Like we have to figure out how to not only make a good song, but how to market it, how to do the business, how to be comfortable with ourselves and put ourselves out there. It all matters. It all adds up. Yeah. And that's why I really stress to other artists and songwriters, like even if you don't go to school for it, like I did to really learn the business of it and to learn that side, because you can take a lot of that knowledge and put it towards your own career. I mean, as an, especially an independent artist, you're essentially your own business. Like you are your own manager, your own, you know, accountant, your own everything. So you have to learn all aspects of it. Um, So that's a really important part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what did that EP start to do for you? Did it open any doors for you? Did it open up more shows for you to play? Like what happened after that? Yeah. I mean, with anything you release, it's just kind of, you know, unless it really, really takes off and like gets you the deal that you need and stuff like that. It's just kind of a good resume builder. So for me, I was able to, you know, when I would submit to play shows or music festivals or whatever I was trying to play, I could put that in and be like, release my first EP in 2017 it's had this many streams in this many countries so it's just kind of like it just kind of shows that you've one grown as an artist and two that there are some people who are interested in you (laughs) because when it comes to you know booking shows or getting signed or anything like the biggest thing they want to see is that you can make them money pretty much yeah and so I mean it's with any release it's important to keep track of the stats and the, the streams and you know the specific locations that it did really well in like my EP did really well in Mexico cool Interesting. <laughs> love it 
Yeah. So I would like try to hone in on that. And it, I would do targeted ads on Facebook and Instagram and put like Mexico as one of the countries whenever I would do that, because I was like, okay, they seem to like me down there. That's great. So I'm going to yeah. like show them more. <laughs> so exactly. just it's everything is such a learning experience um, with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what's your experience been with playing live? Um, have you played a lot of shows in Nashville? Um, do you play with a band? Kind of walk us through your history with live music, I guess, while you've been there. Sure. So I play tons of shows in Nashville, obviously not in the past year, unfortunately, and I cannot yeah. wait to get back. But um, I, I would say my favorite venue to play in Nashville is the listening room. And that's if you've ever been to Nashville or been to a show or you're a songwriter, you've definitely heard of it. Um, I've also played like the Bluebird, which is obviously an iconic venue in Nashville and for songwriters. And that was probably the most intimidating place I've ever played. I played there three times and I still like, I'm so nervous before each performance. Is it just um, the legacy that makes it intimidating for you? Yeah, that, I mean, they have like the pictures of all the incredible artists that have graced that stage. Um, and then also because it's very small, I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a very small venue and it's tiny. It's like next to a laundromat in a strip mall. Wow. And, <laughs> Um, yeah, it's crazy. And the, like, you're here and the audience is right here, just like right in your face. So right. you can tell if they like you or not, because they're going to either look interested or they're not. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's very intimidating. Like my parents flew down the first time I ever played the Bluebird and that was exciting, but also just terrifying. Um, but I played a lot of the songwriter venues in Nashville. Um, Nashville itself unless you play like Broadway and you're like a cover band, it's mainly kind of acoustic stuff. So like guitar, vocal, stuff like that. Um, I do play some full band shows whenever the gig calls for that. But at the same time, when you're a singer, you don't make any money <laughs> when you perform usually. So using a full band in Nashville is very expensive. So like there's a, there were really cool, artist writers night in Nashville called bus call and it's full band and it's just an awesome night, but like, it doesn't pay as most don't, which is fine, but I have to hire a band. And so that costs me money and I don't make any money. So I can't really do many shows like that unless they do pay because I am broke and I can't do that. <laughs> so <laughs> for the most part, I stick with just like guitar vocal, either I'll play guitar at my own gigs or like I have um, some really great guitar players that I'll hire. Um, but yeah, so when it comes to that, I actually prefer the guitar vocal acoustic vibe because, you know, the audience really listens to you and hears your lyrics and stuff like that, as opposed to the full band where it's the full experience, which is awesome. And you get to hear your songs in this like huge way, but I just like the intimacy of having, you know, just a stripped down guitar vocal performance. Um, I played in Boston before and I've used a full band, which is really fun being in my city. Um, I played in the Key West Songwriting Festival, which is every year in Key West and basically all of Nashville goes down to Key West and it's like a giant party and you're drunk the entire time, but it's still really fun and you play um, like guitar vocal there. So I, I do love full band shows, but I would say like the acoustic vibe is, is really fun for me. Yeah. I mean, and that makes sense too. I mean, there's definitely artists that prefer the acoustic vibe the whole way. I mean, look at Ed Sheeran. I don't know if you've ever seen his performances. But he's right. in stadiums and he, of course, he could have a live band, but he's still just there with his own own guitar. And I'm sure he has reasons very similar to yours that he likes probably the intimate performance aspect of it. Even yep. though, it, you know, 100,000 people, there's still something very special about just having one person with one guitar. Um, right. Yeah, I totally get that. Um, what is, how does Nashville compare to Boston in terms of um, the music scene? The music scene in Boston is actually really cool. I don't know much about it because I live in Nashville, but I will say it's grown over the years and it's much more of like a rock vibe. Um, there's some, you know, there's like a house of blues in Boston and there's kind of small rock venues like that, which is really cool. Um, Nashville obviously is more country music, but it's growing. You know, I, in college, I had friends that were pop artists that were rappers that were, you know, basically every genre. And I will say the city's really growing, which is awesome. Um, but you know, obviously Boston's a smaller music scene, but it's still really cool. I mean, when I release anything, there are a bunch of different like local music 
online magazines or newspapers or stuff that I will submit to when they can write reviews and stuff. So um, the, the vibe is different, but it's still, you know, Boston has a really cool music scene. Yeah, it sounds like I've heard good things about it. Um, what advice would you give to artists who are just starting out or just looking for the first steps to make? I would say, you know, no matter where you are, if you're in Nashville, if you're in whatever city you're in, just go out and start playing gigs. That is really just the most important thing. That's the way you're going to get your name out. Um, people are going to really see who you are as an artist. Um, I would also say just like stick to your sound because I feel like nowadays there's a really big like draw to try to replicate big artists and be like, oh, I'm going to be the next so-and-so, but it's like, there's already that person, you know, so we don't need another one. So stick to your sound, no matter if you take meetings and they tell you that you need to go more this way, more this way, like, don't just stick to your own sound because someone will appreciate it and someone will like it. And that's, you know, if you're going to make music and you want that to be your career, you want it to be your most authentic self. So I've taken meetings where they've told me to be more country or they've told me to lean more a certain way in a certain genre. And I'm just like, well, thank you for that. And, you know, maybe if I listened to them, I'd be more successful, but I just prefer to stay to who I am and stay true to who I am as an artist. So that's really the most important thing. Yeah, I love that. I think it's great advice. I mean, I think so many people kind of lose themselves in the process. And I think it's important to have these authentic artists out there who really just kind of hold themselves through the whole process, you know? Right, exactly. That's great. Um, what are you looking forward to? What's coming up for you? I have been doing a lot of writing by myself in the past year during quarantine. Um, so I'm really excited to, my next goal is to like release my second EP. Um, I've released one EP and like a bunch of singles, but I just love releasing like a body of work. And I feel like not a lot of people do that nowadays. I feel like a lot of people just kind of throw out the singles over and over again, which is great. But there's something about listening to like a body of work, whether it's an EP or a full album and just like hearing the story. So my goal this year is to be able to go and record my next EP and just show the growth, hopefully that I've taken as an artist and um, I cannot wait to book my first show back. I'm waiting till I'm fully vaccinated just because, you know, I've been taking COVID seriously. Yeah. Um, so I'm excited to just book my first show back and get back into it. And yeah. <laughs> That's exciting.